Hey everybody, how are you? Uh, hopefully your week is going well. And um, as always, thank you for taking time um, to join us. And um, just as a reminder, if you do have questions at any point in time, please put them into the chat window. We'll do our best to answer them. And not even questions, if you have ideas, suggestions, or anything else that um, you think would be worthy to share, not only with us, but your colleagues that are um, listening to this presentation. So hopefully all of us can learn. Um, some of you are, are new to this, so I'll spend a little bit of time just explaining what we're doing. And for some of you, this is old hat. Um, so the presentation today is gonna probably be a little different than maybe you're used to. Um, so just wanna put that out there and make sure we don't ultimately offend anybody. This is a, I think cybersecurity is a topic that cannot be discussed in a politically correct fashion. We're talking about people ultimately attempting to do bad things to not just our networks and our systems, but ultimately to humans. And in many cases, those are humans that we individually care about, whether that's family or friends or coworkers that may rely on um, the very systems that um, people are attacking. So a little bit different, but um, hopefully you understand the why. Um, this is part of a six part series. Uh, we are today on number four, low and slow attacks, making steady progress. We have two more left. Um, and hopefully, for those of you that have been part of this, you are finding this to be um, valuable and giving you food for thought. And for those of you that are new, um, please know that you can go back and watch any of the uh, videos in this series uh, from our, um, our go to meeting, go to webinar stage. Um, so if you don't know how to do that, please feel free to send us a message at info at sensato.co.co and we will make sure that you um, get access to any of the previous content that we've shared as part of this series. We also have a series uh, this Thursday that's kicking off a three-part series on medical device security. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the end. Uh, very similar to this where it's going to be kind of a no holds barred. Here's the reality of medical device security and what you need to be thinking about and what strategies we hope you will put in place in terms of uh, protecting your patients. Um, so that'll be starting on Thursday and we'll get you, uh, like I said, I'll, I'll share you more information on how to register for that and, and uh, further details uh, towards the end of this presentation. Um, so again, for those of you that are new, we kind of have a thesis to why we're doing this. First of all is, um, you know, we in our work that we do day to day as Sensato, we, um, we often talk to defenders. That's a lot of what we do. And we find that the defender's viewpoint is ultimately very askew of what really happens in an attack. And this leads to some false senses of security. We also see that many times the defenders don't understand the attacker's perspective or what we call attacker's audacity. So we'll talk a little more about that uh, in this presentation actually uh, in a little bit more depth. But those are kind of the things that drove uh, us to say, hey, we really need to do something and really push um, kind of some new type of content out there that hopefully creates dialogue and conversation. And so the way we hope you will use this information here is um, first and foremost, you need to right size it to you. Uh, we can't talk about everybody's specific environment, but we try to be as holistic as possible. Um, so if um, you don't agree with something or something doesn't apply to you, please right size it for you. But as you go through this, hopefully what you're doing is asking, well, if this occurred in my environment, would we be able to detect it? Would we be able to do something about it? And how would we respond to it? Um, so it's a great way to evolve your blue team skills and thinking about this from a blue team perspective. Um, and you can also, you know, think about augmenting what we're telling you, right, is, is making what we're talking about here even more creative and becoming that attacker yourself and attacking your own environment. So, again, hopefully this just creates dialogue and awareness. And again, we don't know it all. <clears throat> so if you have... Uh, either other suggestions or ideas on, on different things we should be thinking about as a community, please share those with us. And if you want to present, if you're interested in presenting, we have a, a, close to 200 people that attend this series. Um, so if you're interested in, in getting your voice out there and sharing your best practices and ideas, please let us know and we'd be happy to turn the stage over to you and support you and, and, and give you that voice. So with all that, <clears throat> let's kind of get into this session. So in this session, what we're going to be talking about is um, what I call um, 
low and slow attacks or low and go attacks. And, and we'll talk more about that, but it just the idea here is ultimately that um, we're not going to have a very fast attack place, right? So I don't, I don't know if in one of the last, in the, in the previous presentations, I discussed this with, with you all as a community, but you may have heard me talk about this either in this series early on or potentially in other presentations that I've done. And that is attack violence and velocity. And I have, you may have heard me mention that we don't really talk about this as part of uh, our cybersecurity strategy very often. And so when we're developing things like incident response plans or layered defenses or whatever it is we're doing, we need to really think about, well, what is the velocity of the attack? What type of attack are we looking to defend against? How fast is it moving? <clears throat> Do we have the resources, both human and technical, to defend against different velocities? Um, the other way to think about that is, what is the highest velocity that you could defend against? Uh, some of you may be able to defend against very high velocity attacks. Some of you may not. You may not have enough resources. You may not have 24-7 monitoring. You may not have single panes of glass. You may not have a security operations center. Um, you may not have a cybersecurity analyst or even a dedicated IT security team. So your ability to respond to fast moving high velocity attacks would be lower. Um, <clears throat> and then the second thing is to what level of violence can you, can you res respond to or, or recover from? And, um, you know, and what we're talking about here when we're talking about attack violence is, you know, if a system, if an individual laptop was taken out versus every laptop in your organization, that's a different level of violence. So we have to think about the amount of violence that we're facing from an attack in order to, again, kind of think about what human and technical assets and resources we need to fend uh, that attack. And again, we can ask that from a perspective of really, okay, if I had something that took out every every smart pump in my environment, you know, that's pretty a pretty violent attack. Would we be able to continue safe and optimum patient care? So an understanding violence and velocity is important. And a lot of the things we've talked about in the past, in this series specifically, have been about high velocity, high violence attacks. And if you've ever attended our cybersecurity tactical incident response program, um, you know that we really focus on fast moving, high velocity, high violence attacks. We start there. And if we get really good at responding to high velocity, high violence attacks, um, then we can throttle back. We can get, we can step back about that because the, the hardest thing to defend them against is a very fast moving violent attack. And then once we, again, get good at that, we, we obviously can, can be pretty good at slower moving attacks. But slow moving, low velocity attacks <clears throat> have a unique challenge in and of themselves that we're gonna talk about here. And really, even though we may be able to say, oh, well, if it's slow moving, you know, if it's a low velocity attack, I can respond to that, right? The challenge with low velocity attacks um, is that they're very hard to detect. They're almost impossible to detect. And this becomes a very challenging situation because ultimately a low velocity attack very quickly turns into high velocity like within within seconds so you're you really need to detect them but they're very hard to detect so it's kind of this wacky challenge oxymoron thing um and so what we're going to spend our time with today is really okay, how do we develop a, a high a low velocity attack right the violence could be still high typically it's not going to be in a low velocity because we're trying to remain covert so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today so I want to start with talking about ransomware and the traditional approach to ransomware. And the reason I want to talk about this is because I hear this a lot when I'm speaking to some of you or all of you or different industry folks is our perception of how ransomware occurs. And I think, you know, if you've heard me speak in other presentations, there's some common things I'll say, like one is most cybersecurity I see is stuck in 2010 uh, or the emperor has no clothes. We have this false sense of security of what we really can defend against. And so in other presentations, you may have heard me say that, this slide here really talks to this concept. In some ways, again, we have this outdated concept of how ransomware works right now. So ransomware for several years has really been kind of a shotgun approach. The attackers went out, they spread, you know, they blasted a bunch of people with emails or they set up watering holes and they had a bunch of people visit them and lo and behold somebody would click on something open something or interact on something 
and voila, ransomware was deployed and it started doing its nastiness, right? Started encrypting files <clears throat> and moving through the network. And for good or for worse, defenders have become better and better at defending of that, right? It's a very cause and effect kind of attack. And we would classify that as high velocity, high violence, right? You click on a link or open something, the attack immediately takes place and it starts to spread. That's high velocity. And it's encrypting or potentially destroying systems. That's high violence. So the problem we have though is attackers have also evolved, right? They have moved beyond this kind of, you know, click and, 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 and fire mentality. Um, the fact of the matter is that when they slow down, they have a much higher return on investment, right? They, they, and their return on investment, just in case you don't know, the average ransomware attack throughout the, the world, not just in healthcare, but across all industry, yields about a 1400% return on investment. So it's, it's really lucrative, regardless of who is carrying out the attack. But the thing I want you to take away here is if your defenses, if your cybersecurity strategy, if your tool sets, are completely focused on how do we deal with this traditional ransomware, you're going to be open, you're going to be one of those organizations that's like, well, how did this happen to us? We have all this, we have security awareness training, we have end user training, you know, we've got all these different things we've been doing um, to, to, you know, prevent ransomware. We even bought special anti-ransomware stuff, and so yet it still occurred to us. And the reason for that is that Vendors and defenders are still thinking about this model of somebody in finance goes to a website or gets an email and clicks on a link and boom, the attack takes place. Now, I, before any of you kind of yell at me about it and say, well, that is how it happens. Yeah, that still occurs today, um, but it is quickly not the predominant methodology, right? If I was going to carry out a ransomware attack, you, I would not do that. Uh, I wouldn't do the whole like spend, send you an email and hope you click and boom, take things out because you probably can defend against it. And that's just kind of the cat and mouse game we play as attackers and defenders. So what is it that we're seeing today? Uh, and I, I call this kind of this, this traditional ransomware stuff, I call it smash and grab, right? We were just basically, we don't care if somebody knows we're there or not. You click, you open, you interact and boom, the ransomware starts to fire. Um, <clears throat> so we're seeing it kind of morph. We're seeing ransomware kind of change how it's being deployed and what's happening. Uh, and it's become a very sophisticated methodology. So what we're kind of seeing is that the first step as, as happened in the past is that the attacker accesses the environment. Now this can be done exactly the way it was done for the past several years, which is I send somebody an email, I set up a watering hole, I get past your perimeter, I get through the firewall or VPN or a portal and I get into the environment. The real difference here in this new world of ransomware is that I don't execute the ransomware payload at this point in time, right? In the past, that's what I did. I interacted with you or you interacted with me and boom, the ransomware executed, the payload executed. What we're doing now is we're accessing the environment and we're, we're gonna chill out. We're gonna slow our roll tremendously. And so I'm gonna then recon the environment. That's really where I'm gonna spend the bulk of my time. Um, so I'm gonna look at your assets, especially what type of software do you have in your environment? I'm gonna to try to find your backups. I'm gonna find your file shares. I'm gonna find your user accounts. Uh, I'm going to find what security tools you're using. Are you using, what kind of firewall are you running? What's the version of the firewall, right? I'm gonna spend a tremendous amount of time just reconning your environment, right? All my goal here is reconnaissance. Um, and we'll come back to that in a moment. The next step is I'm gonna stage the attack, right? I'm going to actually take time now that I have all this intelligence on your environment from my reconnaissance, and I'm going to start doing things to you, but they're going to be, well, I'll get to this in a second, but I'm gonna start doing things to you. I'm gonna corrupt your backups. I'm gonna turn off your security controls. I'm going to establish and or escalate privilege. I'm going to customize my payload, my source code, in order to operate more effectively in your environment. So you, you could be proud of this because what I'm kind of doing is giving you your own custom version of ransomware. Um, and there's a couple ways I can do that, but I'm going to really try to customize it to you. And then I'm gonna stage my payloads. 
<clears throat> that could be a variety of different things. So there's a variety of different ways I could stage the payload in your environment, right? I could put it on servers, I could put it on your antivirus server or your domain server, domain controller, um, a variety of different ways, right? It depends on how I want to execute my payload. Um, but <clears throat> so once I have all that done, I'm going to execute the attack, right? I'm going to deploy my payloads and they're going to run. So what we see here is kind of a coming together of violence and velocity. In the first place here, what we have is a really kind of low velocity, um, high covert um, actions, right? I am going to do things here uh, that don't move very quickly. You know, I may take three, four, five weeks to figure out your assets. I may take days to figure out what types of backup systems you have. I may take another week or two to go figure out all your file shares and your network topology and whatever else you have. What I want you to understand here is as I'm reconning the environment and staging the attack, it's going to take weeks, if not months for me to do. And so when we talk about low velocity in this context, we're talking about extremely slow. You know, it used to be a, a, I forgot the vendor or the, the advertiser, but there used to be a TV commercial where they had like the turtles that were like these slow little turtles. And obviously all of us know about the tortoise and the hare, right? So we need to think about the fact that this is extremely, extremely painfully slow activity that is occurring in your environment. And this is why it's so hard to do. And we're going to talk about the psychology that contributes to, to detecting these attacks and some of the resources and tools. Um, but I want you to kind of just make sure, like, so if I talk about corrupting your backups, right, I'm going to do that very slowly. I'm not going to just go write a script and boom, corrupt every file in a matter of seconds, right? Because you might have file integrity monitoring, um, or you may have file observations, or you may have something else that's going to trip it off, right? And you may have endpoint protection or something. So I got to figure out ways around that. And the best way I can do that, and this has been proven over and over and over, is that if I go slowly, I have low velocity, um, then I have a good chance of bypassing those things. Highly covert is an output of low velocity. If I go slowly, chances are I'm not going to be detected, right? I'm not going to trip anything. And even if I am detected, again, there's going to be a psychological issue that hopefully works in my favor. We'll talk about that momentarily. So we have this low velocity, highly covert for about three different stages of my attack. And then suddenly in an instance, I'm gonna to switch to um, high velocity, right? So this is what we normally think about and associate with ransomware. But what I want you to understand here is that, you know, I've had months, literally months to learn your environment and figure out the optimal time to fire this thing off, right? And so now, and I'm inside the environment, and I may have deployed multiple payloads. So at this point, you have an extremely high velocity. And I've heard, at this point, I don't really care about being covert. I'm launching my attack. And depending on how far my attack has gone and what I've been able to do is, <clears throat> you know, you may not detect it for minutes, which we all know is a big problem, right? Because I may have turned off your security control tools and things like that. Speaking of that, um, here's something I find rather interesting, just as an aside, kind of a tidbit, um, is that the number one software that I see typically not patched when I'm doing HIPAA assessments or security risk assessments is security software, right? It's kind of interesting. Like, you know, I, 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 the very people in the organization, privacy and security uh, uh, professionals that are pushing everybody else, the network and, and server teams and application teams and desktop teams to patch, 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 don't typically patch their own stuff, which is just mind boggling to me especially if now you have attackers that realize that and they can take advantage of that. So just food for thought. Okay, so we have this kind of progress and kind of a, a model of how this attacks. Now I'm using ransomware as an example here, but low and slow type attacks can use, are using this, this blueprint, if you will, over and over for different reasons. Maybe I don't launch ransomware, maybe I do data exfiltration, maybe I set up a denial of service, maybe I, compromise <clears throat> operational control and affect uh, a bunch of medical devices, right? The point of this is it is excruciatingly slow and takes a very long period of time. Um, the question obviously is why don't we, why don't we detect these people, right? Like why is it? So we'll talk a little bit about that. This here 
um, I'm not sure if you guys know what this is, but it's the average amount of days that an attack goes to undetected if it is not a high velocity, high violence attack. So about 197 days. Now, this number changes, um, and also there's different reports like the Verizon report and some others and uh, Poneman Institute and things like that. Sometimes we'll see this number go up to 210, 220, 230. Sometimes we get really good and we drop it down to like 165. Um, but it's a, on average about 200 days that an attacker remains in your environment using low and slow type attacks before they actually reveal themselves. And here's something to food for thought. Typically when an attacker is in this long, the way they get detected is typically one of three ways. A human reports something that then is actually followed up on. Uh, the most interesting case of that um, was an attack that took place um, um, with WellPoint, an insurance company several years ago where they had been attacked and a database administrator came in early one day to to work early, came in at seven instead of like 9 a.m. and couldn't log into their computer. They luckily notified the help desk who luckily notified IT security and then they found out, oh my gosh, somebody's been logged into your computer every night for the past six months between the hours of midnight and 8 a.m. So that's how they detected them. A human detected it and the right things fell into place. If that database administrator wouldn't have reported it, people wouldn't have taken it seriously, just told them to reboot, there's a good chance the attack would have continued or never would have been discovered. The other name for that attack is the Anthem attack, Wallpoint Anthem. Second thing is honeypots. Honeypots are one of the most crucial things to detect people moving throughout your network because no matter how slow they go, if they're trying to ascertain assets and they're trying to discover what's on your network, they're eventually going to touch the honeypot. And it is a critical tool in your arsenal to figure out like somebody's gotten past everything else. So what do we do about it? Uh, the other thing piece there would be honey tokens. And then the last one, a way of being discovered is the attacker just reveals themselves, right? They shift from being covert to, okay, it's time to, to party and they're gonna just launch their, 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 their attack. And now you know they're there because they don't really care. They've already gotten the upper hand on you. They're already moving and they've already figured everything out in your environment and possibly shut things off and corrupted your backups. So that's kind of just, again, food for thought and we're gonna keep diving deeper into this. So, what is the number one reason that these attacks are not detected earlier? It's a really simple reason. And if you want to take a shot and put something into the chat window, feel free. Um, and, uh, you know, but there is a reason that is common for pretty much all of these attacks. Like when we get called in to do incident response and we find out it's a low and slow attack or an APT or something like that. Um, and the reason I don't reference this as APT is because I think APT just talks to the end state. Right? We have this advanced persistent threat. Well, first of all, it's not that advanced. Right, It's not like somebody's coming in here with like Jane Bond stuff and deploying it on your network. It's pretty straightforward, simple stuff they're doing to you. Um, yes, it is persistent. Um, and it's not a threat, it's an attack. You've been attacked by the time you figure this out. So I like using low and slow because that's what it is. It's somebody's attacking you in a very low, slow, methodical manner. But what is the number one reason that these things are not detected? It's not technology. Um, it's, it's typically um, defender rationalization. We rationalize what we're seeing, hearing, or figure, or, or, or this happening. Chances are that an attacker that gets into your network and is trying to remain covert <coughs> is going to give away some hints. Uh, the thing about it is when we say remain covert, it doesn't mean that you will have zero alerts. It doesn't mean like if I broke into your network, there's a good chance I'm going to set off some alerts, right? But the alerts are gonna be kind of weird. They're not going to be like, oh my gosh, there's a SQL injection attack, right? Or, oh my gosh, here's DDoS, or here's brute force, or you know, here's you know whatever. And I think most of us believe that's it, that's the big one. Like, well, that's what we're looking for, right? We're looking for that big, you know, here it is, right? Here's a command injection attack. This is the real one, right? What I do as the attacker, whether I do it on purpose or I do it by accident, is I saw it off little things, right? I'm gonna set off like, oh, user lockout, right? How many of those do you see a day, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, um, you know, pinging an address and maybe I'm gonna set off a honeypot, right? And what happens is as defenders, that ain't the big one. Like those are noise, 
right? So that causes some problems. And what we, we've learned over the years, since 2013, when we started Sensato, is that there is something called rational response theory. We created this, and it, it really is an important thing to understand. Uh, I don't think I've presented this in this series. If I have, I apologize, but we'll review it anyway. Uh, and rational response theory is simply a kind of observation of how defenders react to a critical situation. Now, the good news here, if there is none, is that it's not just security, cybersecurity people that do this. We see this behavior, rational response, in law enforcement, in emergency medical services, um, in Department of Defense, in the military. We see that anytime people see early indications of what could be bad, or they see really dramatic indications of what could be bad, they typically will rationalize. Uh, I'll give you this quick example. There was a power company out in Seattle. The board of directors asked um, a cybersecurity research team to come in and look at um, a set of smart grid technology. And the cybersecurity team got a hold of the smart grid technology and really went to town on it and said, hey, look, this thing is really insecure. The power company, what you see on the, on the slide here, basically said, no, that's not possible. You couldn't have done that. It doesn't support that feature. The researchers were like, yeah, we know it doesn't support that feature. We added that feature when we broke into the firmware. The power company then said, well, it would only infect a small population, right? They're, they're electric company. Not many people's homes would be affected by this. The researcher said, well, yeah, but in about 24 hours, if we pulled off this attack, we'd impact about 250,000 homes in the Seattle area and turn off everybody's power. Power company said, well, not a big deal. We would just update the firmware from our command center and we would restore the power. And then the researchers pointed out, well, we kind of took away your ability to update the firmware. So the only option you would have is to physically replace all 250,000 of these smart meters once we uh, carried out our attack. And the reason I use this is because, and we're not going to go real deep into it. There's a whole different kind of talk around this, um, that this all shows the psychology of the defender, right? Where we're rationalizing, or the board of directors here rationalized, they didn't understand the attacker's audacity and what attackers would do to somebody, right? They're like surprised that the attacker would remove features from the system or turn things off or take out the ability for somebody to do something. Now, think back to what I just said to you. And if you study any ransomware attacks of recent history, you'll see that the attackers did turn off antivirus, they did shut down the IDS, they did shut down you know, the, 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 they did corrupt the backup systems. So what we see here, and this, this, this actually occurred back in like 2014. Um, so, you know, this kind of rationalization continues, but the thing I'm trying to point out here is as defenders, as cybersecurity professionals, you know, we rationalize what we see. And typically we're going to rationalize those small little indicators that are telling us somebody is in our network and we're waiting for the big one. And unfortunately, when that big one occurs, it's too late. And then later on, we found out like, oh, yeah, I guess somebody was in our network and we just never paid attention to it. Um, so this brings me to this concept of false positives. Uh, we see this a lot in both security operations and network operations. And really all it is is, you know, basically saying that something that is occurring isn't really an issue, right? That's kind of what we're doing. It's a false alarm. Um, you know, hey, a honeypot went off. Oh, you know, that's a false alarm, you know, um, or hey, you know, we have a, a large amount of group policy changes. Oh, well, you know, that happens every once in a while, you know, uh, or, you know, a PowerShell script ran. Oh, yeah, I think we were doing maintenance on a system or I think, you know, Lisa was doing some kind of upgrades, you know, I'll, I'll talk to her, you know, I'll, I'm sure it's fine, right? Um, you know, or, you know, hey, we're using the same uh, admin account to log in and, and manage the environment that we do to use for email and we use for a day-to-day -day Teams communication. Oh, you know, it's hard. It's just hard to go back and forth between two different accounts. I mean, it's I got a lot going on. These are all false positive, false, false senses of security, and they are typically what an attacker is going to thrive on. And this is why even if I attack your network in a low and slow approach, and I set off, and I don't remain 100% covert, there's still a really good chance that the defender psychology will play against them and, and be in my advantage. And you'll overlook or rationalize the things that I do um, by mistake, right? Because I'm not really trying to set off alerts. In most cases, sometimes I might do it, but we won't get into that today. So the idea here is that, and I know this is like, well, the next issue is, well, we don't have enough resources, but you do have to think about how alerts 
what alerts are trying to tell you. Right? Every alert that you get is ultimately a cybersecurity issue. It is an underlying problem. If there is something in your environment that is pinging something it shouldn't be, that is an issue. Whether an attacker is doing it or not, it needs to be addressed. If there are group policy changes, and there's a lot of them, whether it's an attacker or not, you need to think about why there's so many group policy changes occurring in our environment. Even if it's something that can be kind of explained, you want to minimize that, right? If you, somebody's running PowerShell scripts and they didn't send out notification to people like, hey, we're running PowerShell scripts between the next couple hours, or communicate that so people definitively know and don't just go, I think that was Lisa, yeah, I'll check later. Those are all issues. You are being told by the environment like, hey, I've got some problems here, right? The reason I use the image on the right-hand side of the screen is all so often, in fact, this just happened to me in real life where I volunteer on a, an EMS unit and we had somebody who had been having chest pains all day long. And then it started at something like 10 in the morning. They decided they didn't need to go to the hospital. It's no big deal. It was Friday and they didn't want to go to the hospital. Uh, 9.30 that night, I got to meet that person. And five minutes later after I met them in the back of the ambulance, they coded and eventually died because they had a heart attack. Now, the same exact situation a few weeks ago where we had somebody who called us at three in the morning because they were having severe chest pain, decided they weren't going to go to the hospital because it was three in the morning. They'll just call their doctor in the morning. And then later that morning, we got called back around 6.30 that they had already passed into sleep. So the reason I'm telling you that, and it may seem a little dramatic, is we do the same thing, right? We see symptoms. We see the chest pain that occurs in our environment, and we just go, ah, we'll deal with it later. Or, ah, you know, not a big deal. I, I'm, it's fine. I probably have just a little bit of indigestion. My network has a little indigestion. I'm good, right? The reality is, whatever alerts you see, network or security, you know, how big or small, they are symptoms of something in your environment that isn't configured correctly or an operational policy or procedure that needs to be addressed. So keep that in mind. Uh, rational response theory, we typically minimize the things we fear. Right? We are probably scared that this may be the big one, right? That the honeypot went off and yeah, you know, 70% of all real attacks are detected by a honeypot before most other things. I really hope this isn't the big one. So I'll go find the rationalization for it. We don't see the evil perspective, right? All of us are good people. I, every one of you that attend this series, I would bet anything that you're a good human being. You're a good person, right? Maybe a little quirky because you chose this line of work, but you're a good person. You're not evil. So it's hard sometimes for us to think evil. And because of that, we don't give the attackers the credit for the audacity or the respect that they deserve because they don't have any rules. So we go, oh, who, who would do that? Um, ultimately, your rationalization is my first hope as an attacker. It is literally the first thing I'm hoping you do is rationalize whatever it is from information you put in job descriptions all the way through to how you configure your network. Um, you know, I had a conversation with somebody the other day and they told me there was no need to monitor their network because you know, they were pretty locked down at the desktop. Um, and I was like, okay, well, uh, I'll call you or you can call me when you have an incident. Um, so let's keep going. Ultimately, there's no such thing as a false positive. I'll give you a quick example of some rationalization that we see. And I may have done this in the earlier um, presentations, but let's say you have an alert. I don't care how the, what tool, the, you know, generates this alert, but let's say you have an internal IP address, right? This is inside your DMZ not exposed to the outside world behind your firewall. And it's interrogated by an external IP. So literally somebody outside your organization has found a way to ping SSH, FTP, do something to an internal IP address. And that raises an alert. Good news there is, wow, you got the right monitoring tools in place. Now, if you're sitting there going, I don't know if we would ever be able to detect that, how would we detect that? Then you probably need to get new monitoring tools. But the point of this is, here's the alert. Now, I can tell you that when this alert comes up, all too often what I see people do is say, well, let me go check my firewall logs. I'm not really sure why you're checking the firewall logs, but okay, party on. Um, and typically somebody will say, well, there is no indication of that communication in the firewall log. So I guess, you know, there's something wrong with the tool. That is rationalization. Right. And, and when I point that out to people, they'll say, well, how would a conductor, you know, how would somebody get past my firewall? Again, you're rationalizing. If you really believe an attacker cannot find a way against through your firewall, you need to go back to the very first uh, 
session we did in this series where we went through kind of all of this stuff on how to get past a firewall and all the different things we could do to get past one, even if you've taken a lot of time to secure it. So the reason I bring this up is that ultimately this is rationalization. This is basically saying it's a false positive. And this is a big issue because if you've had this happen to you, there's a good chance something's occurring. All right. So we've kind of gone through the, the psychological side of this. We've framed out what is a low and slow attack. We've understood now, hey, these are kind of hard to detect, right? But I want to talk about this from the attacker's perspective now. So if I'm going to attack you, what do I do and, and to, to kind of not set off the bells and whistles, right? Um, and just before, and I don't have this in the presentation, but I'll just mention it. One thing to always keep in mind, uh, and when we talk about audacity and attacker's audacity, this is something, a really big lesson to take away. Every tool that you own for security is available to attackers. I don't care if it's Palo Alto, I don't care if it's Citrix, CrowdStrike, Sophos, Bitdefender, whatever it is, attackers can buy the same exact tools you buy. And with a 1,400% return on average for ransomware attacks, they have a lot of cash to go buy stuff. Now, the first question somebody will ask me when I bring this up is, well, why would somebody sell to an attacker? And I'm like, well, how do you know they're an attacker? Like, it's not like Bugs Bunny, right? Like, it's not like Wiley Coyote, who we all knew was the bad person and always, you know, bought his stuff from Acme. And we all knew, like, don't sell it to him, right? Why are you selling him those big bombs? He's just going to go after the roadrunner. That's not it, right? Now, I'll give you an example of, the, of just the audacity attacker in a different context. Several years ago, there were several people from Russia who were indicted by the FBI for spying on the United States. You can go read this and look up this case. It's a public case. And how did they carry this out? How did they spy on the United States? What do you think they did? Do you think they broke in to a U.S. embassy? To, and they were actually, they were here in Washington, D.C., carrying out the spying. Did they drop electronic you know listening devices in you know hotel rooms they set up a string of escorts to get information out of congressmen and senators and generals no it's nothing like born identity they did nothing like james bond what did they do they set up a catering company it took them three years to get this catering company up and running it became one of the top catering companies in washington dc and eventually, this catering company was contracted to come cater parties at some of the most predominant people's homes and events. And that allowed their caterers, who were basically Russian spies, to walk around and eavesdrop on conversations during these parties. And so the reason I'm telling you that is it's not that hard for anybody to co-create a limited liability corporation through Zoom and then go contact CrowdStrike or any other company in the security business and say, hey, we're looking to set up a, a new company. We need to secure our environment. Can we buy your tool? And once I have that or just get a trial version of it, now I have the ability to reverse engineer. So just understand the audacity, the level of, of, of what your opponent is able to do or could do. So there are a few things we're going to go through in terms of from the attacker side, things I want to be careful of doing, right? Um, so first thing is, I'm going to make sure my team, if we were all on a team together, I'd be saying to you guys, like, all right, everybody here, we're going to go after XYZ hospital, and I want to make sure everybody knows the rules. First thing, we're going to do low amplitude. I'll explain low amplitude to you in a moment, but basically, we're not going to make any big moves, right? We're not going to be exfiltrating large amounts of data, right? If we have to exfiltrate a file, and that file's a gigabyte file, we're going to extricate 50 megabits every three hours until we move that gigabyte file out, okay? So that's the level of slowness, right? And I doubt many alerts are gonna be fired for anybody moving 50 megabits of data across your network or out of your network. So just to give you an example, but low amplitude. As attackers, we're gonna go low amplitude. Second thing, we're gonna go low velocity, right? Not only are we gonna move things easier, but if we have to, ex if we have to query a system, if I have to run Nmap, I'm not gonna just run an Nmap scan and scan every port you got. I'm gonna sit there and scan one port every 45 minutes. Now there's 65,000 ports. It's gonna take some time, but I can bet you that most tools will never ever alert on a single port being interrogated uh, at a time over a period of time. So we're going to keep things very low and slow. That's the first key principle here. Second thing is, 
a lot of people got some new AI model tools, right? And we're like, oh, let's go get neural nets and deep learning, and those things will be able to figure out what our environment works like. Well, low amplitude over time is the mathematical formula that we're looking for here, right? So the way deep learning models or neural nets work is they learn your environment. So typically you deploy them and then they take a bunch of time. Sometimes it's a few days, sometimes depending on the complexity of your network, it could be several weeks where they figure out what's the baseline of your network, who talks to who, what, what uh, IPs you have on the network, things like that, right? So we end up with something that looks like this, right? And basically, you know, within, we're gonna say that through here is normal. So as an attacker, I need to be inside of this amplitude, right? I've got to fit inside of this world. And as long as I keep my activities within that amplitude, I'm okay, because the neural net's just gonna assume I'm part of the normal traffic. Now to do that, there's some rules I have to follow, right? I can't use malware, because that'd be giving me away. But as long as I fit into your traffic, and I don't come out here and do this stuff here, or this stuff down here, I'm not gonna be an outlier. So that's why low amplitude is critical. But now if I have time, right? Because there's time here, this is my time, right? And this is my amplitude. So as I have time, what's going to happen over time if I continue doing what I'm doing without detection, right? Is ultimately what's going to happen is this me in here is going to be a new input into the neural net. And that is eventually going to come out as a new normal. So now my activities are normal. And that's the key to getting past a lot of the AI models. And there are some other ways to do this. And there's some other things defenders can do from an AI perspective to defend themselves. I'm not going to go into either one of those right now because this video could go out to whoever. But in a basic level, what we're going to do here is retrain the model. Now to do that, I need time. And the reason I keep bringing up time is because a lot of us have this concept of attacks that they just occur immediately and that the little things we're seeing, right? The little things that we're seeing, all those little false positives are what I'm doing as an attacker in this range here. They're all the little false positives that pop up, all the little pings, all the little external IP that don't show up in your firewall log. They're all the honeypot alerts. They're all the, the small group policy changes. That's what I'm doing here, but it's nothing really crazy. So it just kind of seems normal and it becomes a new normal after a period of time, whether we're talking about a human or we're talking about an actual AI model. So that's the second thing we're going to do as an attacker. We're going to maintain our amplitude in such a way that if there is AI on the network, we're going to retrain it. Um, there's a few things we want to do while we're out here. We're going to start targeting assets and we're going to talk about why we do this and how we do it in a few moments. But the one big one I want to do is I want to go after software. I want to know what software you have in your environment. Why? Because patch levels are important to me. If I know you haven't patched, then I'm going to go after that. I'm going to exploit that. How do I figure out what software you have in your environment? There's something known as JAW3, where I can do SNMP walking. I'll talk a little bit more about SNMP walking in a moment. JAW3, happy to talk about it if anybody wants to, but it's uh, basically a fingerprinting model that looks at uh, MD5 hashes and creates fingerprints of software uh, transactions over TLS and SSL. Backup systems, I want to break the integrity of your backup. I have to do that. For my ransomware attack to be extremely effective, I have to assure that you can't come back to me and say, hey, big deal, I'm just going to restore from backup. We'll talk more about that in a moment. I need to figure out your file shares. I can't move my payloads across your network unless I do that. SMB is my friend, right? These other ones, yeah, they're pretty cool. I could probably use them, but chances are you probably lock those down. Uh, maybe not SSH. A lot of you guys leave SSH open, but SMB, man, do you guys have a lot of outdated SMB, guest SMB, don't even shut down SMB full access on SMB, and that just allows me to go to town all over the place. I do want to figure out your network topology. Uh, one interesting thing we saw once was an attacker who made a copy of Landsweeper, literally copied the client's Landsweeper environment, created a second version of Landsweeper, and then used that Landsweeper to catalog the environment and, and develop all the asset information. Um, and then some other things, Nmap, SNMP, and Python is my friend. And then obviously privileges and accounts, right? I wanna do what I can to figure out what privilege levels I can get to and what accounts. Again, all of this is going to take place over months, not, not hours. So SNMB walking, this is in a tool called SNMB walk. You can get this, I think for free. 
uh, you used to be able to. Um, and you know, here I'm just putting an address in and I'm gonna guess at the OID and then I'm gonna get back really cool information. Cisco, right, I'm gonna get back a bunch of other query information. Um, eventually, if I do this throughout the network, I'm gonna get a really good picture of everything that's on that network. Uh, this was used in an attack called Orange Worm several years ago. The attack started by somebody uh, coming against the RIS PAX portal in hospitals, traversing that portal, and then getting involved and just basically grabbing all of the asset information. Luckily, they didn't do anything. They just cataloged people's networks and went away. Nobody knows why they did it or whatever happened to that, but interesting. Okay, let's talk about backups, because this is one where people are like, well, are we able to backup? Okay. Uh, so this company, Jelvix, did this, I thought it saved me a lot of time in having to put this together, right? But basically what we have is the attacker gains an endpoint, right? They get somewhere. And you go, well, I have endpoint protection. Okay, well, if I don't do anything wrong, nothing nefarious, and like, so what? You got endpoint protection. Now, <clears throat> I do lateral movement, right? I move from one machine to another. Why? SMB is my friend. Or I've got privileges on that machine because your user did something wrong and they have access to file shares. Or you have a backup agent on that machine. Or I get to a server. Either way, once I get to there, um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to disable the backup, right? Um, <clears throat> and at that point, you're not really backing up anymore. Now, hopefully you have a backup system in place that alerts you when there is zero files backed up or if the agents have been turned off, the backup agents are offline. If you don't have that, you really need to find a way to get to a place where those two things are gonna occur. You know, if backup agents are turned off or communication with backup agents is, is not made, or you get no backups over a period of time, like within 24 hours uh, or 48 or whatever you guys do, intermediate or full backups, you need to have that alert you. It's a critical thing to know because if you find that a backup agents are offline, or something hasn't been backing up, or has not been backing up correctly, and you get a lot of backup errors, you may have an attack. And this is one of those times where a lot of times we'll see people, their backup agents are turned off, and we'll hear this as part of incident response, like, yeah, you know, we've been having trouble with the backup agents for weeks. Well, what did you think was happening? We don't know, we just, you know, we have no idea. It was the attacker turning off the backup agents. And then somebody would turn them back on and they had a, basically a window service that would just go back and turn them back off. And they never got questioned. It just, somebody thought it was like, oh, it must be something wrong with the backup system. Yeah, it's called a human is breaking into your environment. Um, <clears throat> all right, second way I can go after your backups. So let's say we have a server, right? And we have a bunch of servers and we have a backup. On that server, we've got a, back, a bunch of important files. And we have a, a way to get those files backed up to something. Now, I'm using cloud backup here, right? And the reason I'm using this purposely is because a lot of times people give me the stock answer, like, well, we've got a, a, a cloud backup system. And I'm like, and what's that mean? You know, I'm not sure. So I can, remember, I'm in your environment for quite some time now. So if I gain access to this server, one trick I have is to deploy my bad file on your environment. Now, the first thing I hear from people is like, well, the backup stuff has antivirus built into it. Okay, I'm not deploying a virus and I'm not deploying malware. I'm just deploying some computer software, right? And what it does, I can bet you, is not going to be detected by antivirus because I wrote it from scratch. So there's no matter pattern or matching going on. And so it's gonna get backed up. Now, <clears throat> the problem with this, once it gets backed up to the cloud, along with all your other files, what happens when you restore? So you let's say I take out this infrastructure and now you come back and you're like, well, let's restore from backup. Let's restore from the cloud. You're going to bring my stuff back here. So the moment you bring that back and this guy reconstitutes, I'm gonna destroy this again. Now you have a problem, right? Because every time you restore from your cloud environment, or and this could be on-premise, it doesn't matter if it's the cloud, I'm using cloud because as I said, a lot of people tell me, oh, it's in the cloud. It's gonna just keep, propagating over and over, right? So even if you start this server from scratch, you format it, you buy a brand new one and you restore, my stuff's up here and it's gonna keep coming back down to you. Now, is this an easy thing to kind of figure out? Yeah, but it's annoying, right? And it's gonna take you several days to figure out which file amongst whatever you're backing up is the actual culprit, especially if I play with some different ticks, tricks around file properties and, and the way I construct that file. 
what I'm trying to tell you here is you don't want to wait until you have an incident to figure out that somebody has gotten something on your system and it's now been replicated to your backup systems. And now when you restore, you've got it. You've got to figure out how to, to deal with that. Both of those things I just covered are kind of like amateuristic, right? They work and they work really, really well. And we see them a lot. The one that I like doing, like if I wanted to come after you, is this one here, where I just, instead of giving you any kind of malware to go after, I just start messing with these files. I just scramble their their binary uh, layout. I just open them in binary mode. I delete a bunch of bits. I overwrite some bits. I do some binary writes, and then I just save them back to disk. And <clears throat> what happens is you basically are backing up these files but they've all been corrupted and so if you keep doing that remember i'm in your system now for 197 days 200 days on average and over 200 days i basically have just kept overwriting your binary your your files so now you go to restore you're you're going to be in a lot of trouble right you're you're and most organizations i know of can't use data that's 200 days old Right. If you think about patient records and things like that that are 200 days old, we lost 200 days worth of data, that would be a problem. But this is probably the most, the coolest thing I can do to you is just mess with the source of the data. Uh, and it's not that hard to do. Right. And all I'm doing is just changing the binary uh, contents of the file. So how do you detect this? You can use file integrity monitoring. Right. You can say, hey, any of these files, if they change, throw off an alert. Right because it's not a virus that's running, it's not malware that's running, it's just something that reads a file, writes it back out in a different way and saves it. Doesn't change the file name or anything like that. So it becomes an issue. So file integrity monitoring, big deal uh, when it comes to stuff like that. So that's the backups, that's how we kind of compromise backups. And there's a few other ways, and again, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't wanna get onto those, but I'm happy to talk about them offline. The other thing I'm gonna tell you guys if we're attacking somebody is don't do common. So we're gonna have a rule that if I break into somebody's environment, I am not going to use any kind of malware, right? Why? Because we're gonna trip all kinds of stuff. So I'm gonna write some custom source code and I'll explain that in a moment. I'm gonna also make my source code polymorphic and we've seen the rise of polymorphism in ransomware and in, in pretty much all malware exponentially. It's a big deal because it does help get past um, a lot of uh, the antivirus uh, stuff. Um, so if you're looking for antivirus, ask about does the antivirus support the use of fuzzy logic? Why? Because if you're using fuzzy logic for antivirus, there's a good chance it will capture polymorphic behavior in uh, malware. If not, and it's not able to do specifically fuzzy logic, just as a free consulting here, if somebody says to you, well, we have AI, say, I, I'm asking you specifically, do you have fuzzy logic, right? Go back to your engineers and ask them, are they using fuzzy logic algorithms for the detection of malware? If the answer is, well, no, it's AI or it's deep, deep learning or it's neural nets, that's not good enough, okay? Um, use a value C. So none of us are gonna be allowed to use any indicators of compromise. Why? Because they're easily detected, right? We know the bad stuff. So we're gonna establish one-time private public infrastructure. Why? Because we have a 1400% return. So we're spinning up a bunch of servers on Azure, AWS, Google Cloud, or some private, <clears throat> private network here in the United States, private cloud environment is pretty feasible, right? We got money. So why are we gonna go and like spin up stuff on a known IP that's malicious, right? So no use of IOCs. We're also not gonna use traditional command and control. Uh, if I have to do this, I'm going to use like POP3 or SMTP or good old HTTP. I'm going to go through a regular website. So any kind of command and control I have to do is going to be done through normal traffic channels, not like some crazy thing that is going to determine like, oh, this is a, a tunnel going to Pakistan and, you know, that's not good. So again, the point here is as attackers, we know what not to do. And we're going to review that and make sure we don't do it. As defenders, you should be thinking about Okay, if they do this, how do I detect that? How do I actually find that out? Um, so I wanna talk about polymorphism. What you see here on the screen is a really simple little ransomware snippet. Um, and basically I could take that snippet and if, I, if, if we run this snippet, it'll get detected. An alert will go off. 
uh, because there's a pattern to this and antivirus and other tools will be like, hey, that's the pattern. So the way I get around that is I take that snippet and I add some code like this, right? That says get good and then I'm gonna do some math on that good, which I'm not gonna do here. And then I'm gonna take that math outcome um, and actually this should be like this X. Um, and I'm gonna do some magic stuff that I'm not willing to publicly disclose. But the point of that is, is that it's going to change the pattern over here every time this runs. So that is basically in the most simplest terms, kind of an example of polymorphism. Every time I run this application, it is going to have a different signature. Even if I run it on like 10 different laptops in your environment, every one of those will look different to antivirus. What it won't look like is a known signature. So, <clears throat> and for those of you who don't know what a GUID is, it's a uniquely identif uh, unique, uh, globally unique identifier. It basically looks like this. It's, when I say get GUID up here, this X is going to be like these numbers. I do some math on these numbers and that changes the body of the code and that changes the way that it's viewed by uh, pattern recognition. And if you have AI, again, you need to understand what is the ability to detect behavior and to what level. And I'm a big fan of fuzzy logic. Japanese use it a lot uh, for a lot of different things. And we don't see it a lot here in the US, unfortunately. So let's talk about some common myths and fallacies, things I hear people say about these low and slow attacks, or generally some attacks. Um, First one is the cloud backup. Well, we've already kind of talked about it, right? Like whether you put stuff in the cloud or not, if I get to your files and start scrambling them, if you if I send my malicious stuff up with your stuff, um, if I shut off your backup agents and you don't back up stuff, um, all of those things are gonna contribute to you having a bad day on, re on recovery. So my suggestion to you is do a three, two, one backup strategy. If you can't do it today, try to have a strategy that over a year you get to a three, two, one. Um, there are a lot of great organizations out there like CloudWave and some others that do an amazing job with helping people get three, two, one strategies in place and then manage them and support them. Um, you have to do recovery testing. And I know everybody hates doing this when we do disaster recovery and business continuity planning. This is like everybody's like, nobody does it. Right, I, we get told they do it. Like when I do HIPAA assessments, they're like, oh yeah, we do recovery. Like, okay, when's the last recovery you did? Well, you know, a couple of months ago. Well, what'd you do? Well, you know, we just go make sure the files are there. I'm like, no, have you actually logged into Meditech or Epic and actually restored files? Well, no, we don't do that. That's a recovery test, right? A backup recovery is when you log into the original application and you're able to actually read the backup back into that application and you confirm the integrity of the backup. Now, you can't do that in production, but you can do it in test and training systems. You have to do that. Maybe it's every six months or something. You can't do it every day or every week, obviously, but you have to check because if you don't, you may find that you're, if, you're in, if you go to do a restore and the backup integrity is gone, you, that should set off a lot of bells and whistles in your head. You should be like, oh my gosh, this is a problem. And you need to really dive into, okay, did somebody get to this? Has somebody gotten to our data? Encryption, I hear this a lot. Well, it's encrypted. I don't know why this is such a big deal, but you know, whatever. Um, here's the thing. If you've encrypted your data, obviously if it's on the wire, yes, great, encrypt it. Um, but data at rest, um, okay, as an attacker, let's go play through this, right? Well, before even we play through it, there's three things you need to be doing. And if you don't do all three of these, then the encryption doesn't really matter. You must have strong keys. Right? If your keys for the encryption are not strong, you got a problem. You have to have strong encryption. So if you don't have a strong, you know, at this point, 256-bit encryption, you've got a problem. And lastly, where are you storing the keys? Because if you don't have the keys under lock and key, hopefully in a, in a, like a storage vault, key vault, right? And I'm talking about not a physical place. I'm talking about an electronic key vault or something like that. Um, then you're gonna have problems because if I get to your admin accounts, I'm gonna to get to your keys and I'm going to decrypt. But here's the thing, forget that. Let's say you have really strong keys, strong encryption and strong storage. I'm not going to copy your database. Like literally that doesn't make a lot of sense. Let's say you have a one or two terabyte database and it's encrypted, right? Well, that's all good and you should do it. I'm not telling, nothing here is telling you not to do it. What I'm telling you is don't have a false sense of security. If I play through this, what am I going to do an attacker to get to that data and bypass your encryption? What is the big thing I would do to you, right? What's my big focus going to be? My big focus is going to be get a user account that has access to that data. 
right? Because if I log in as that user and they have access to this data, then the encryption doesn't matter because I'm logged in as a valid user and I can see the data and then I can start exporting or doing whatever I'm gonna to do to you um, and bypass your encryption. So should you encrypt? Yes. Should you have strong keys? Yes. Should you have strong encryption? Yes. Strong storage. But please think about how the attacker is really gonna come after you, right? Think about encryption as a check mark for compliance and not truly a security defense. If, if hopefully that makes sense. All right, one more thing and then we can get out of here. Uh, so I just wrote this real quick because I don't know how many of you really have seen ransomware code or how easy it is to 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 do. Uh, the first ransomware that I knew about way back in the day, even before WannaCry, um, was written off of a sample of Microsoft.NET code that was posted by Microsoft on how to do a cryptography. Somebody took that and then just automated it. So I just took this. This file is called Voldemort because I like um, Harry Potter. and um, Basically, I wrote this little file. Now, this entire file is a full-blown uh, ransomware script. If you guys want it, you can have it and just email me. And uh, I will tell you right now, if you type Python and followed by Voldemort.py and you put this anywhere on your computer, it will encrypt it. So if you would like a copy, um, it's a lot of fun at family events. You can just walk up to your uncle or aunt or somebody you don't like, brother, sister put it on their machine and you can encrypt it. Um, <clears throat> so how does this work? I just wanna kind of walk through this real fast with you to give you kind of a sense of you know, what it does and when we talk about it. So we're gonna just import some files. One of the files we're gonna use is a library file called Fernet. So we're just basically importing a cryptography file here. We're then gonna create a structure to hold all the files on your environment. And we're gonna for loop through that. And basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, hey, go look at the directories and give me a list of all the directories that are on this system. Now, if you have network shares, that's gonna show up as part of one of the directories that I get a list of. Now, if the file is called Voldemort, right, or I'm inside of the directory where Voldemort is deployed, I can't encrypt that. I don't wanna encrypt Voldemort, and I don't wanna encrypt the directory with Voldemort in it. So I have to have a little bit of exception processing. That's all this does. It basically says, hey, if the file you find in this scan is Voldemort, ignore it. And if you're in the directory that Voldemort is in, ignore that, okay? So that's all that does, right? So once we kind of get through that, we've got this list of, we've created this set of files and we print it. Now in real life, in a real attack, I'm not gonna print out the files, right? I'm just gonna run this and you'll never know it ran until you look at your files or try to open them. Um, but you know, since we're all friends here and if anybody does wanna use this and play with it, you can get a printout of all your files. If you are looking to see how this works and you don't wanna encrypt anything, you should probably right here type in the word quit and then it won't go any further. But again, if you're trying to have fun with friends, you would just let this run. So what I'm doing here is I'm generating a key. Every time I call generate key, this Fernet library is gonna automatically hand me back an encryption key. I then go and tell this thing, hey, I want you to create a file called the key, and I want you to write that file to disk with this key. Now, this is the only piece of the code where if I was doing this for real, I would probably find a way to email, transmit, communicate this key to wherever I lived. And now I would have your key, right? And then if you don't pay the ransom, I don't give you this key. If you do pay the ransom, I will give you this key and a decryption program, and then you can decrypt your files. But that's basically, when we're talking about ransomware, this is the little thing that everybody's paying millions of dollars for. And this little line of code is what generates that so important key. So the reason I do this here is because when I'm testing this, I wanna actually have the key so I can run my decryption program. And basically this just writes the key out to a local file. But again, in real life, we wouldn't have that key stored on the disk. We would transmit it to the, to the cloud. Okay, so this here is the real code. Once we have all the files that are in your directory, we're gonna loop through them and we're going to read them in, right? We're going to encrypt them. We're gonna read this file in. We're then gonna encrypt the file. Let me clean this up a little. And we're going to encrypt it with that key, right? So now all of a sudden I have this encrypted file. I then open that file 
and I write back that file in a binary format. And guess what? When that file gets written, because I encrypted it using this key, it's now encrypted on your disk. And that's it. So all of this here is what the big fanfare is about. Now, can we do stuff to make this a little bit more polished and do things like network traversal and polymorphism? And yeah. But ultimately, you know, we're talking about like, you know, even if this was a fully blown commercial grade, quote unquote, ransomware piece of software, it's maybe going to be 150 to 200 lines of code. And this is in Python. We can move this to C. We can move it to C sharp. We can move it to whatever. But I will tell you this. You can take this Python code, deploy it, make literally one or two, maybe three little changes to this, and it would take out your network. So Voldemort does live. Um, all right, wrapping up. Um, here's the medical device security stuff, July 14th, 28th, and the 11th. Uh, if you wish to attend, we're going to put a link in the chat, and you can also email us at info at sensato.co, and we'll get you registered. Free class, we're going to go deep into best practices on a compliance basics, how to look at detecting threats and what to consider, how to respond to an incident that involves patients. Uh, so we'll do all that um, through this. So you know, we'll go into a lot more, 501k security considerations, things like that, patient warranty, uh, patient liability, consent and warranty issues, things like that. So hopefully we'll see a lot of you in that. Um, Got to keep the lights on. Please, if you guys uh, have the need for things like risk assessments, 853, HIPAA, C2M2 maturity modeling, you need a virtual CISO or virtual cybersecurity analyst, uh, you're thinking about tabletop simulations or pen testing, please at least give us a chance. We'd love to work with you if we're already not working with you. Um, if you haven't and you're thinking about trying to take your security to the next level, uh, really would love to talk to you about security as a service. We have a pretty amazing platform. It does include things like honeypots and host intrusion detection and file integrity monitoring and real-time deep packet inspection and all kinds of cool stuff. It's fully monitored 24-7 by a security operations center, and the program includes a full medical device security um, program as part of the, uh, the offering. Um, so with that, hopefully this was helpful. Um, you got something out of it. I don't know, Laura, if we have any questions or, or, or things people would like to share. Uh, if so, happy to take them. Uh, if not, um, thankful for, for you guys putting up with me today. Laura? We don't have any questions at this time. All right. All right, everybody. Thank you so very, very much. Uh, remember, these uh, presentations will be available to you if you need them. If you have questions, my email's up there, john.gomez at sensato.co. Stay safe. And if there's anything we can do for you, please reach out. Thank you so much.